Welcome to week 13 of Classical Mechanics 2. I'm Sabata Matsumoto, and sadly, this will be the last week of video lectures for this series. I've learned so much from all of your interest and feedback, and I hope these videos have helped you get a deeper understanding of classical mechanics. This week, we'll be exploring some real-world applications of 3D rotations. First, we'll look at two different ways people represent the rotational state of a 3D body, Euler angles and quaternions. In the next video, we'll find that the Euler angle description is a natural coordinate system to study the physics of rotating tops. In this video, we'll explore several different ways of thinking about rotations. Even though we live in and interact with the world in 3D, much of the physics we do is two or even one-dimensional. That makes it much harder for us to construct equations when we have to think in 3D. All of the different ways of describing rotations here are equally valid, but some may make more or less sense to each one of you, and that's totally fine. We'll start with matrix representations, then use them to describe Euler angles. Euler angles are great for lots of physics applications, but there are some problems with them when used in robotics and video games. So many developers use quaternions instead to describe rotations. Doing 3D animations is a big part of my job, so I do use all of these descriptions when I work on different types of problems. I use modified versions of Euler angles in Mathematica graphics because rotation matrices are a natural part of its graphics language. When I do animations on the GPU, I use quaternions because manipulations of 4x4 matrices are built into the physical architecture of GPUs. Many of the pros and cons of each method relate to whether or not the coordinate system is based in the lab frame or the body frame. That being said, I personally find quaternions to be a really natural way of thinking about rotations. The first thing that we're often taught about rotations is that rotations don't commute. On the left, I'm going to rotate my triceratops by 90 degrees first about the x-axis, and then by 90 degrees about the y-axis. And this is the final orientation. On the right, now, I'm going to rotate about the y-axis first, and then about the x-axis. And this is the final orientation of our Triceratops. The two dinosaurs are definitely not oriented in the same way. One way to think about this is to note that matrix multiplication doesn't commute. When we want to rotate a point P in 3D about some axis, we often use rotation matrices. In physics, to find the position of a point P after it has rotated by some angle theta, we multiply the vector P by the rotation matrix R, where R is on the left side of P. This is sometimes called pre-multiplication in computer science. In video games, we often multiply on the right. This is called post-multiplication. This is because in a first-person viewpoint, every point in the rest of the world needs to rotate with respect to your camera. This is similar to the idea that instead of actually moving through a level, the player is often kept stationary at the origin at all times while the rest of the world moves underneath them. An intermediate notion between these two viewpoints, a fixed lab frame or a fixed body frame, is the description of rotations using Euler angles. This coordinate system x, y, z is in the lab frame, but we want to keep track of what happens to a copy of that coordinate system that gets stuck to the object. The description I'm about to show you is a convention we use in physics. There are many other conventions with rotations in different orders, about two or three independent axes. First, we'll rotate the body about the z-axis by some angle phi. This gives us new axes ex and ey in the body frame. Then we'll rotate this new coordinate system about the EY axis. And we're going to rotate this by angle theta. The Z axis now becomes EZ, and the EX axis now becomes EX prime. Lastly, we'll rotate about the new EZ axis by angle psi. This gives us new coordinates, e x double prime and e y prime in the body frame. 
x hat, y hat, and z hat are extrinsic coordinates. So these are coordinates in the lab frame. This new coordinate system, ex double prime, ey prime, and ez are intrinsic coordinates, which means that these are coordinates in the body frame. We can turn this into a rotation matrix that we construct in two equivalent ways. If we think about all the objects existing in the lab frame, the way I set this problem up, first we'll rotate about the z-axis by angle phi. Then we need to work out what our new EY axis is in the lab frame and then rotate the body by angle theta about that direction. And lastly, we need to work out what the new EZ axis is in the lab frame and then rotate about that by psi. That's all quite a pain. That's a lot of unnecessary algebra. So the other way to think about it is to think about the body coordinates. So in this system, the matrices are much simpler. I don't need to work out the rotations about some, uh, some new awkward axis, but the rotation order seems like it's backwards. So that's going to be our catch. So first, we rotate about the body's z-axis by some angle psi. Then we rotate about the body's y-axis by some angle theta. And lastly, we rotate, lastly, we rotate about the body's z-axis again by angle phi. Because we're in the body frame at all times, that takes care of needing to rotate the axes in the lab frame as we go. The rotation matrix we arrive at is this. First we rotate by psi in the body z direction, then by theta in the body's y direction, then by phi in the body's z direction. And that gives us this matrix here, which I'm not going to read to you and I don't expect you to remember it, but the main idea is thinking about how we arrived here, and that's a quite useful way of thinking. Despite this appealing way of writing down a body's 3D rotational state using a single rotation matrix, Euler angles aren't without their problems. Let's look at the slightly different description of the 3D state of a body that's used in aviation. Here the frame is fixed to the aircraft's body where one direction is aligned with the normal direction of motion, one is aligned with the vertical direction during normal flight, and then the last is the direction transverse to those two. Rotation about these axes are called yaw, pitch, and roll. These rotations can also be expressed as if the object lived at the center of a gyroscope. Each of the circles in this gyroscope frame, often used in CAD and 3D animation applications, are called a gimbal. These rotations, yaw, pitch, and roll, can be described as orientations of all three of these gimbals. This description leads us to two problems with Euler angles. When two out of the three gimbals become coplanar, we effectively freeze out one degree of freedom. That is, we lose the ability to independently control the rotations in the two coplanar gimbals. This is called gimbal lock. This actually happened with the control system on the Apollo 11 moon lander. The stability system got stuck in a gimbal lock configuration, and the pilots needed to manually correct to regain control of the craft. Another problem is that interpolating between two rotation states using Euler angles doesn't make physical sense, as you can see from this animation. Imagine we want to describe the direction that a vector is pointing in. We could do that using coefficients multiplied by unit vectors, which is pretty much the standard thing we do in physics. But how about this? We could also do this by defining this direction as a point on the unit sphere. Imagine we take the tail of the vector and move that to the origin, then make it a unit vector. The tip of that vector will always point to some location on the surface of the sphere. Since the sphere is two-dimensional, we need two numbers to describe a 3D direction, or we could just use a complex number. 
if instead of a direction, we want to find the full 3D rotational state of a rigid body, we need a little bit more information. At every point on the surface of the sphere, the 3D object can rotate about its local easy axis as well, like this. We can think of the whole 3D rotational state of a rigid body as a point in some other manifold. Constructing this manifold isn't easy. Mathematically, it's the twisted product of S1, so the rotation about the EZ direction, with S2, which is the unit sphere. And this gives us a space called RP3. This space is a unit 3 ball, which is the sphere, but with all of the insides filled in, where antipodal points on the boundary get glued together. I'm going to glue the word glue on this side to the word glue on this side. And that's going to be the map that we use to construct this manifold. So this isn't the easiest thing to visualize, but we can use the double cover of it to make it a little bit easier. S3 is the unit sphere in four dimensions, and that's the double cover of this space. You can think of it as all of Euclidean 3 space, where you take all of the points at infinity and kind of glue them together at one point. And points in S3 are described by quaternions. Quaternions were discovered in 1843 by William Hamilton of Hamiltonian fame. He had been trying to understand how to extend the complex numbers to higher dimensions. At first, he tried to do this with two complex quantities, i and j. He just couldn't seem to get the algebra to work out. So one day, the 16th of October to be precise, he was out walking in Dublin when he realized that his algebra would work if instead he had three complex quantities, i, j, and k, in his algebra. He was so excited that he carved the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication into the broom bridge itself. So, vandalism by a mathematician. This here is the fundamental formula for quaternion multiplication. i squared is equal to j squared is equal to k squared is equal to minus 1. And the product i, j, k is also equal to minus 1. So we'd like to understand what this means in terms of rotations. Imagine we've got unit quaternions i, j, and k. Each of those represent a rotation by pi about each of the cardinal directions x, y, and z. This is a view of RP3 again. Each point inside here corresponds to a unique 3D rotational state for our triceratops front. Points in the i direction represent rotations about the x-axis, where the angle is given by the signed distance to the origin. If that distance is negative, then the rotation will be by minus that angle. Points along the j-direction correspond to rotations about the y-axis, and points along the k-direction correspond to rotations about the z-axis. That way, a rotation by theta about some unit vector u, which is equal to ux times i plus uy times j plus uz times k, is given by this quaternion here, which is equal to e to the theta on 2 times the vector u. After using Euler's identity on the three different complex quantities, we get that our new quaternion is cosine theta on 2 plus our vector u times sine theta on 2. We can express quaternions in this sort of complex notation where i, j, and k are complex numbers, or we can look at them as a group. The unit quaternion a plus bi plus cj plus dk, where the magnitude of q is equal to 1, can be represented as this 2 by 2 complex matrix a plus bi, c plus di, minus c plus di, and a minus bi. Or equivalently, it can be written as a 4 by 4 real matrix. A minus B minus C minus D, B, A minus D minus C, C, D, A minus B, D minus C, B, A. In our normal three-dimensional space, we can write any vector P as a quaternion where the real part, so this A term, 
is equal to zero. Then a rotation of this point is given by conjugating the quaternion P with the quaternion Q. Likewise, we can express quaternions as orthogonal rotational matrices. So this is a, just a normal three by three rotation matrix, the same as we're always used to. It turns out that the fact that quaternions are points in S3 also solves the Jenke interpolation you get with Euler angles. A geodesic path that connects two quaternions in S3 is actually a sensible path in that it minimizes unnecessary rotations. It also turns out that quaternions are even more numerically stable than rotation matrices and Euler angles, which makes them quite appealing for use in real-time 3D graphics. Because of the simple relationship between vectors and rotations using quaternions, this is used by a lot of video game developers and roboticists to describe systems with nested sets of rotations, where the rotation state of one part may depend on that of another part. Here are some examples from my work. All of the animations I'm going to show you are from a collaboration with Henry Segerman. I'll put a link in the description. This is a single arm. These are a series of 3D printed parts, and it moves like this. I can combine five identical copies of this arm together to make a deployable mechanism. Here is a similar mechanism that doesn't just extend in the cardinal directions. In this video, we've explored several ways to describe the 3D rotational state of a rigid body, rotation matrices, Euler angles, and quaternions. Which of these methods makes the most sense to you? Let me know in the comments. In the next video, we'll use the Euler angle description to derive the Lagrangian formulation for a heavy top. See you next time.